healthy lifestyle. I think our, our title was, You Are What You Eat. And, you know, this is kind of a phrase that started in the 1960s, and so it's, it's a little well-worn, but it is still, nonetheless, very true. Literally, the food that we eat goes into our stomach, it gets all mixed up, it gets digested and, and taken apart, and then rearranged as the actual tissues that make up our body. And so literally, everything that we are comes from what we ate. And so, as a dietitian, as an early dietetic student, nutrition student, uh, to me this was just fascinating. And I have to say today, after mm, 30 years as a dietitian, I have to say that I'm still fascinated about nutrition. Now these days, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions about nutrition. In fact, as dietitians, we, we explode myths all the time. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do today. Uh, uh, let me ask this question. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Memorial Cooking Innovations? Do you all know when I say Memorial, I see, I don't see a lot of hands up. Memorial Cooking Innovations, okay. Uh, Memorial Cooking Innovations, sometimes we just call it MCI, uh, is a locally produced television show that Memorial in Lufkin cooperates with the city of Lufkin and uh, uh, basically you put a chef and a dietitian together and you create recipes that are healthy but also interesting. So healthy eating, and this is a takeaway today, healthy eating, healthy lifestyle does not have to be uninteresting and bland. Actually, healthy eating it can be a very interesting thing. Now, it does take creativity like anything of interest. You know, what we put into things, of course, is what we get out. But but that's one of the messages of Memorial Cooking Innovations is that, uh, you know, Chef Manny teaches us some basic cooking skills and, and how to do things a little differently we might not have thought about. And the dietitian, me, I talk about nutrition, okay? Well, one of the precepts of, uh, that we go over and over on Memorial Cooking Innovations is eating healthy is not just about exclusion. Okay? We all know that we're not supposed to eat very often bacon and sausage and ribs and chips and candy and sodas. You know, y'all don't need a dietitian to tell you that, right? Okay. And that's what I mean when I say exclusion. You know, if I'm adopting a healthy lifestyle, I'm going to minimize my choices of those high fat or high sweet foods. Okay? But the part that we often leave off is the inclusion part. What do I include in my diet for healthy eating? And this is a part that really only in the last few years have you heard more about, at least in the scientific literature and in the popular literature. For example, uh, a handful of nuts five days a week can reduce your risk of heart disease by 50%. Did y'all know that? So you can cut your risk of heart disease in half by including a handful of nuts five days a week. This was a very large study, Loma Linda, California, uh, done actually uh, a couple of decades ago. It's not a new study. And, and, you know, historically we've always said, well, don't eat nuts because they're too high calorie. They're too high in oils. And that is true. They are high in fat, but they're healthy oils. They're monounsaturated fats, which is the same as olive oil and avocados, uh, all nuts and seeds. These are sources of monounsaturated fats. And so these are heart-healthy oils. These are the oils we want in our diet. Okay? So there's, there's a takeaway today. One thing that I can do to improve my health, reduce my risk of chronic disease, is to eat nuts on a daily basis. Now, the key word there is a handful. <laughs> they are high in, in fat, and it's healthy fat, but we have to think calories, don't we? Okay. Any nuts, salted or unsalted. This study said it's good for men, it's good for women, it's good if I'm normal weight, it's good if I'm overweight. All groups, 
uh, uh, raw or roasted or salted or not. Any nuts. It didn't matter. Peanuts, walnuts, almonds, cashews, it didn't matter. All nuts are good for us. Okay? So that's a good change that you can make when you leave today. I'm going to put on my grocery list. Now here's a key tip that I'm telling you about. If, I'm, if I come and talk to you about nutrition and you say, oh, that was great. He's, he's such a good looking guy and I really like him. I really enjoyed his presentation. But then if you leave and you don't ever do anything, then it's all for nothing. The key is, is what am I going to do starting this week to improve my diet? What am I going to do? And this is one of them. So I've got to get it on my grocery list. That's where eating healthy starts. It starts with our list. Does everybody make a list when you go to the grocery store? It's a very good habit. I do too. I do too. Very good habit. Okay. All right. So eating nuts on a regular basis. Handful. Five days a week. <coughs> All right. What, are, what would be some other examples of inclusion? So what are the foods that I want to include in my diet? Well, well vegetables is a very good uh, answer. Now, I want to I define that a little bit. All vegetables are good, okay? All vegetables. In fact, I'm going to even say all plant foods. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains. They're all good. Now you notice I said whole grains, not refined grains. We can talk about that in a minute, but let's, let's come back to what you were saying. Okay. All vegetables are good, but just like people, some are better than others. Okay. And, well, green and leafy, in fact, we use color as a rough guide to lead us to nutrient-dense foods. So in vegetables, we're talking about those that have deep, rich colors. So tomatoes. People who eat tomatoes have lower incidence of heart disease. Okay? Uh, uh, pumpkin. You know, uh, we were talking earlier that most Americans don't regard pumpkins as anything more than a holiday decoration. It is such a shame and a waste. If you knew the nutrient profile of pumpkin, these bright orange fruits, squashes is what they are, that, that we just throw away. If you knew the nutrient profile, you would find a way to include them in your diet. They make a great stew. Use them as you would a potato in your next stew that you're going to make. We're about to see some fresh pumpkins, and so pick up one for the kids, but also pick up our grandkids, but pick up one to cut up, and you got to have a sharp knife, and before you do that, if you'll go to, if you'll watch the show where Chef Manny showed us how to carve a pumpkin, not carve it, but to cut it, because they're tough, they're hard. You got to have a good sharp knife, and uh, on, on, we're Memorial Cooking Innovations is in 46 cities across the country. Okay, we're in eight cities in Texas. We're not in Livingston. So the only way y'all can get us is uh, going to memorialhealth.org. And in fact, uh, I have, I, let's see if that's on here. That's not on here. The website, one more time. Uh, the website is memorialhealth.org. Memorialhealth.org. And in fact, I have some cards uh, that, that if, it has the website on the back of the card, so when you leave, pick up a card. Uh, but the value of watching this online is you can download, okay, the recipes that I uh, had to give to you today, those are examples of some of the recipes that we've developed since January. But if you go on memorialhealth.org, you can look at all of our past shows. We've been doing this for about, I think, five years coming up this fall. And so it's a couple of years back, and you'll see Chef Manny carving a pumpkin. You can watch the show. You can download the recipe of uh, uh, beef and pumpkin stew. Okay? So anyway, nutrient-rich foods are the ones that we should include. Okay? And we use color to identify these. There's a few exceptions. Cauliflower is very nutrient-dense. We don't perceive it as a rich color. But uh, broccoli, greens, uh, all greens. The greens that we eat right here in East Texas are excellent foods to eat on a regular basis. Beans and peas, okay? Beans and peas we don't think of as a 
color food, but they're very rich in vitamins and minerals and the kind of fiber that really helps us a lot. Now when I say beans and peas, I'm not so much talking about green beans, not that they're bad, but I'm talking about pintos, limas, butter beans, crowders, you know, all the beans and peas that we all grew up eating. Is everybody here from East Texas? No? Okay. Okay. I j okay, South Texas. So, West Texas. Okay. Well, you know, really in the South. In the South. Now, I don't know about West Texas. West Texas, y'all are a little bit different. But my wife is from Abilene, so she's a little different. I, I, I like her because of that. Okay. All right. But, but most Texans grew up eating beans and peas, you know. And, and these are foods that we're familiar with, and actually we should eat these on a regular basis. Okay, so eating healthy. One of the barriers that I hear over and over from people, uh, well, I don't have time to cook. Okay? You ever heard that before? You ever feel that way? Okay. Okay. I can relate to that. And as a dietitian, I happen to be one of the dietitians who enjoys cooking. I love foods. Uh, nutrition was really my first love when I went into dietetics, but, but I really enjoy foods too. I like knowing different foods and, and I, I enjoy cooking. Well, you may not enjoy cooking as much as I do, but if, you're, if you find yourself pressed for time, you have to find the strategies that work to help you to make gradual changes. Like, for example, uh, find an afternoon that you're going to cook. Okay, so I'm going to cook this afternoon. Okay, I've got my glass of wine. I'm going to enjoy this meal. Okay, and I'm going to eat this uh, when it's done, but I've also got a whole pot that I'm going to put in Tupperware containers with a Sharpie that I'm going to write on a piece of scotch tape with the date and what it is and put it in the freezer so that later I've got a, a nice meal and it's home cooked and it's nutrient rich. Okay? So beans and peas would be a perfect example of that. Okay? You don't like beans and peas. Okay, that's all right. There's other things, there's other things for you. Okay. Uh, but barriers to overcome, we have to look at it that way. How do I make changes in my life? Okay, uh, and the changes that, and this is true for all of us. It's as true for me as it is for y'all. I have a brother that uh, he really does not care about nutrition, and it is his right to eat whatever he wants to eat. Okay, he's entitled to eat to drink whole milk. He's entitled to eat chicken fried steak. Well, a lot of people feel that way, but. The problem is, is you know, he's had a triple bypass surgery and he's overweight, and then and, and unfortunately that entitlement got him to where he is. Okay, and and the reason I'm telling you that is because if I don't do what I do on a daily basis, I'll be in the same boat. I've got his genes. If I don't keep my weight, uh, you know, within a desirable level, then I'll have diabetes. Okay? I'll have hypertension. I'll have to start taking medicine for it. Okay? And so all of these are reasons why uh, we want to begin to make changes. Okay? And we have to look at making changes. There's a couple of points there. One is we make small changes gradually. Okay? So we start with that grocery list. And we start, uh, you know, at including the foods that are good for me. To and we start leaving off some of the foods that are not. Okay, we're making healthy choices. And who's driving the boat on that? We are. That's right. We're in control of the choices that we make. Okay. And so we have to we have to adopt strategies that will help us that are supportive of a healthy lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? And to sustain it. And to sustain it. That's a very good point. Well, now let's talk about what is eating healthy. Because when I say the word diet, I would guess my psychic powers actually are telling me that when I say diet, most of you are thinking weight loss. Okay? And, and that's true for everybody. When you say diet, you, you go on a diet to lose weight. Well, <clears throat> that's the problem with the term diet. For me, eating healthy isn't about a diet. 
The problem with the diet is, is it has a beginning and an end. And what happens at the end? I gain everything that I lost plus just a little bit more every time. And, and that's what happens. Okay? So that's the problem with the diet. Okay? Diet is also... Well, let me say it another way. Uh, <clears throat> weight loss is maybe one thing that... You know, I want to manage my weight, so I don't want to eat too much. That's calories in versus calories out. How much I eat versus how much I walk around. I don't want to eat more than I'm going to walk off today. Okay? But healthy eating is more than uh, weight status. Also, healthy eating is uh, eating to uh, have a good blood pressure. Okay? So, what it would be a... Everyone here knows what mineral makes my blood pressure go up. What is it? Salt, or we could define that to say sodium. Okay. You know, there are, foods, there are foods that don't have salt in them, but they have a lot of sodium in them. Baking powder would be an example. So shortbreads, y'all remember homemaking class? Shortbreads, everything leavened with baking powder, baking soda. Those biscuits, uh, 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 pancakes, waffles, these are relatively high sodium foods. We don't think about those, but they are. They don't have much salt in them. Cornbread would fit into that category. Okay, so we want to limit how much sodium we take in. Now also, because sodium is used as a, and it's always been history, not just new, as a preservative to preserve the shelf life of foods, uh, we get a lot of sodium in the foods that we eat when, uh, when we may not even ever use the salt shaker. And so the thing to remember there is, is start looking at the sodium content of canned vegetables, for example. You ever notice that? They're real high. Now remember, when you're looking at that facts box, it says, uh, it defines in one serving, and so this is like uh, three quarters of a cup, let's say, in this can of beans. And how many servings are in the can? Uh, three and a half. So if one serving of canned beans has 600 milligrams of sodium. If you eat the whole can, that's three and a half times six. What's that? Three times six, 180, 1,800. 2,000 milligrams in a can of beans of sodium. And 2,000 milligrams is what we should get for the whole day. Yes, ma'am. But when you take out, but I noticed on the canned vegetables and things, when they take the salt out, they load it with potassium. And isn't that equally as bad? No. In fact, I'm glad you asked that question. Potassium is good because... Well, if you're a kidney patient, that's a separate rule. Okay. That, okay. Okay. You, you raise a good question. Let me make sure everybody got that. Okay. So, the, so, the mineral sodium raises our blood pressure. If I'm, if I'm in kidney failure or I have chronic kidney disease, I also have to be careful of potassium, okay? Now that's something I can't change. But what I want to say about potassium is, just like sodium raises blood pressure, potassium lowers it. Potassium, and there are two other minerals that lower blood pressure. Do you know what they are? Calcium and magnesium. Now, we don't talk a lot about minerals because, you know, it's one thing just to get all these fats straightened out, you know, and which ones are good and which ones are bad. But, but we're all learning on this journey, and now we're learning more about minerals, and potassium, calcium, and magnesium all lower blood pressure. Now, these minerals you find in a lot of different places, but especially you find them in fresh fruits and vegetables, okay? So, and bananas are a good source of potassium. Uh, you find them in uh, nuts, okay? Magnesium and potassium you find in nuts and seeds. So, ses not sesame, uh, pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds. And you can get those unsalted if you look in the right place. Uh, uh, one familiar food to all of us is high in all three of these minerals. Do you know what it is? Well, no, this is, a, this is a food that all of us know about, and it's high in calcium, potassium, and magnesium. Milk. Milk. All dairy products. Okay, now, a lot of people are not milk drinkers, and that's okay, but yogurt is possibly an option. 
Okay, and we want to choose, since we're watching calories, we want to choose a non-fat yogurt. Okay, you can choose the flavored ones. Just get one that's non-fat. And if you really want to be good, don't get one that has the jelly in the bottom. Okay? <laughs> they tell you it's fruit, but it's really just jelly. You can see for yourself. Scoop it all out. And it, it, if it doesn't look like jelly, you can call me. Okay? Well, and Greek yogurt is very popular right now. Just remember that when it says Greek yogurt, it doesn't mean it always really is Greek yogurt. But, it's, but it still may taste good, and it still has all those minerals in it. It just might be a little bit more expensive. Okay? But, but, uh, but the point is, and it doesn't have to be Greek yogurt to have the stuff in it that I'm promoting, and that's these three minerals, okay? So yogurt might be one of those things, well, I'm not really a yogurt eater, but uh, I might be willing to try it. So that might be something you get on your grocery list. Start with just one of those individual ones, you know? And if you don't like that one, try another flavor. But what you're doing is, is you're making a change, and the reason I'm including yogurt in my diet is because, and this is true, this is a statistic, most Americans, if they don't have hypertension now, they will have by the time they hit their 60s. That's true for most Americans today. Okay? The reason is because we eat a lot of sodium throughout the course of our life, and as Americans, generally, we just don't walk a lot. We get in the car and go wherever we're going, you know? And, and so act, lack of activity also plays into hypertension. Yes, ma'am? And I was going to say, when you look at the, the ingredients on yogurt, some of them have just a few ingredients, the essential ones. But a lot of them, especially nowadays, have this graphic long list of things you can't pronounce. You don't know. And uh, some of those may even interact with some medications, and we just don't know yet. Okay, did everybody hear what that no. question was? Okay. <clears throat> When you're looking at the ingredients of yogurt, uh, there are a lot of things that you don't recognize, a lot of words. And uh, the comment is, is sometimes those ingredients may interact with medications that you're taking. Uh, that, well, so let's take the first one. The, if it interacts with medications, that's not really anything I can help you with on that. That depends on what medications. But you also said, or you just may not want those different ingredients because you don't know what they are. Okay. Well, let me address that because this plays into a common misconception about food additives. Okay. When you say food additives, there's a whole, you could do a whole lecture on this. Uh, things are added to food to extend their shelf life. And we have a negative thing about this because we think, well, it's a preservative. It's got to be bad for me. Why do they put it in there in the first place? Well, the reason is because it increases the shelf life of this product so that that thing of yogurt that you buy, if you don't eat it this week, it's still going to be good next week and it's not going to have mold grown on it. And that's the reason a lot of those things are added. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that all additives are okay. I'm just saying that generally we, t we Americans take a negative view, a dim view of food additives when there's not a lot of science that says that all of those are bad. Maybe some of them, yes. But I do want to talk about, when you're choosing yogurt, uh, something that you do want in the yogurt. And that is, you want the uh, healthy uh, cultures, the, the good bacteria. It, well, acidophilus is one of them. There's a dozen of these different kinds of bacteria that, that in your gut, there's always this war going on. So everything in your gut, this is like the small intestine, and the war is going on between the good guys and the bad guys, and they're bacteria. And the good guys are on your side, and the bad ones, you know they're going to make you sick. Okay? And so the idea of consuming a, what they call a probiotic, which is what these bacteria are in yogurt, and also in Activa, you see what's her name do the commercial with Activa, uh, but uh, and there are, there's a whole line of these products now, okay? And these are good products to consume. Uh, the reason is because you're just supplementing the good bacteria. You're helping the good guys in your gut. And uh, uh, we used to think that healthy gut was just a function of the 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 only benefit we get out of that is just regular bowel movements, okay? Actually, a healthy gut is one of our prime 
uh, defenders against infection. And so we get, we get sick less often if we keep uh, this healthy flora, bacterial flora in our gut, that balance. So this is a reason why uh, uh, you see a, a proliferation of these kinds of products like Activa. When you're choosing a yogurt, look for as many of these different offices, you know, like uh, Acidophilus, and you'll see them. They're all listed together, and most yogurts today will have three different ones. Sometimes they'll have four. But that, that and it being non-fat are your two biggest criteria. It's not whether or not it's Greek. It's not whether or not it's uh, flavored. It's how many bacteria does it have. You want as many as you can get. Check the date, because if they're live cultures, they're only good to a certain date. So always, sometimes that date's, you have to find it. It's not easy to see. But that's something to look for in a good yogurt. Yes, ma'am. Let me ask you real quick about milk. What about almond and soy milk? Are they still good or not? You know, I just got this question on Monday, and I have to tell you that I don't know the answer. Okay. Now, here's, here's what I do know. Uh, do, you guys may know this. Uh, 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 nutritional analysis compared cow's milk to soy milk or, or uh, almond milk. I, I know that I know that the nutrition profile is slightly different. Uh, what I don't know, I'm a little foggy on almond milk because I haven't looked at that in a long time. Uh, I don't think it's as high in protein. I, I want to say it's about half. Okay. Uh, and so on that, I, I'm just going to... Higher in calcium in the almond milk? It says on there 50% of the milk. I think that's why it's got almonds in it. Well, okay. Okay, let me talk about the calcium part first. We have to think about, we have to think about how we use calcium. Okay, now here's a, here's a point. Now this is something that you wouldn't have learned unless you came to talk to me today. Okay? Calcium in a supplement or as added to almond milk is not the same as calcium that you get in milk or yogurt. Here's why. Calcium is hard to absorb. You have to have the right conditions in the gut, the right pH. You have to have a carrier to carry it from the gut into the bloodstream. And you have to have it in the presence of vitamin D. Okay. Well, all of these conditions are satisfied by dairy products. Okay source of vitamin D, right pH, etc. So the calcium that we get in dairy products, yogurt or milk, whichever, cheese too, uh, that's going to be better absorbed and you're going to get more of the calcium than if I take calcium supplement. In fact, this is a general thing I'm going to tell you. A lot of studies are showing that nutritional supplements, pills that I take, potassium or whatever, I'm not getting the benefit from that that I would if I was eating them in foods. If you take too much vitamins, too many, more than your body can use, yes. you can do damage to your kidneys yes. because they have to throw them out. Not only that, not only do when we, when we mega dose is what you're talking about. When we mega dose on vitamins or minerals, we can damage things, but we can also create imbalances in the body because our bodies are, are designed to use foods in synergy, synergistically, working together, different things working together. It's just how the body works, okay? Now, a lot of people don't mega dose, but a lot of people do take a handful of supplements a day. As a dietitian, uh, traditionally, we recommend it, especially for ladies who t traditionally don't drink milk, to take calcium supplements. Well, there's studies out right now that question that. Uh, that may not be a good thing, to take calcium supplements. Yes, ma'am? If you're lactose intolerant, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And the only thing I can offer you on that is, first of all, lactose intolerance is something that is progressive. It starts at a certain age and it gets worse. Okay? Some people who have lactose intolerance can tolerate small amounts of yogurt or cheese, ice cream, but they can't tolerate milk. Okay? And then also, on the milk side, uh, there, there's the lactate product, which, and, and, so, and so you can tolerate that. Now, it doesn't mean, if you're just not a milk drinker, then that's not 
for you, and that's okay. You have to find your calcium in other places. Okay, and I want to move this. So, oh, 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 yes, ma'am. Supplement they have caltrate that has calcium and vitamin D together in a chewy thing. Okay, well, okay, did hear the question? If if the supplement has uh, vitamin D with it, calcium and vitamin D with it, that's the better one to take. But the study that I saw was questioning the whole calcium supplementation thing. And, and I don't want to go into all the details on that because I've got some other ground I want to cover. And that is, I started talking about healthy bones as part of you know, what I want to do. That's the calcium part. Uh, blood pressure, that's these minerals, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Okay, but also, and this is relevant to us, uh, as we age, starting at age 40, we start losing 10% of our muscle mass per decade. That means that if I started in, at age 40 losing 10%, by the time I'm 70, I will have lost 30% of my muscle mass. So my arms, my chest, my legs, all of the muscles that hold everything together and keep me walking upright, okay, that keep me active and doing the things that I like to do, all of those muscles are gradually going away. And this is an age thing, okay? This is something, none of us are getting out of this alive. <laughs> We're all going to get old and die. You know, Tim the dietitian can't change that, okay? As good as I am, I'm not that good. But there are two things that I can do to slow that down. Okay, one is resistance training, or in other words, using my muscles, okay? Yeah, working, doing things. Uh, and, and, uh, and every muscle group, you want to find some activity that works them. Okay? The second thing is, is I want to consume adequate protein. Now, for a long time, dietitians have been telling you less meat, less meat, less meat, because meat is a source of saturated fat and heart disease and, and heart attacks and strokes, and so we have to eat less meat. Well... That's true for the man who's eating meat and potatoes and he's 300 pounds, okay? That's true for him. <clears throat> and it is true for me that I don't want to have a heart attack because I'm eating too much red meat. But there's a balance to this story, just like there is in every story. And that is that Adequate protein for me is one gram per kilogram. Now let me just kind of talk this, and you don't have to know the kilogram part, but basically if you want to take your weight and divide it by 2.2, that tells you how many kilograms you are, and that tells you also how many grams of protein you would get in a day. Okay. So for me, as an example, uh, I would take my weight, 154 pounds, and divide it by 2.2, and that would equal 70, 70 kilograms. And that tells me that I need about 70 grams of protein a day. That's adequate protein intake, okay? All right, now where I'm going with this is, is that we should divide, in order to, if I'm going to give myself 70 grams of protein, it's not enough to just eat all of that in one steak. It's better to divide that 70 grams over the course of a day in three meals. So if I divided 70 by three meals, that would be about 23 grams per meal. Now, I'm kind of getting a little technical with you here, but I'm, I'm doing this to illustrate a point. Okay, so uh, that means that I need to have a food source of protein at each meal. Okay? And in fact... A handout that, that I have, and I, I did make more of these handouts uh, because I intended everybody to get one. So if you didn't get this one, uh, pick it up on your way out, okay? And what this is doing is it's talking about what is a balanced meal. And the picture that's on here is protein, starch, non-starchy vegetable, fruit, and dairy. So this is like the ideal meal, okay? It can also be an ideal snack. So the point of this handout is, is every time I eat a balanced meal or snack, a balanced meal means it has foods from different groups, protein, starch, non-starchy vegetable, fruit, and dairy. These are different food groups. Remember the food groups? 
Okay, well, it's kind of a variation on that. But basically, we get batches of nutrients from different groups of food. And the point here is, is I should have a source of protein in every meal. So at breakfast, uh, an example on here is egg, that's the protein, toast, there's the starch, margarine, Okay, we're going to, that's okay. We can have a uh, teaspoon of margarine. Juice, that's the fruit. Skim milk, there's the dairy. And so that would be an example of a balanced breakfast. Okay, here's another one. Yogurt, what group is that? Okay, muffin, what group is that? Starch, good, y'all are good. Uh, uh, banana, walnuts. Protein, there you go, that's right. It's protein and fat, actually. It's protein and fat, okay? And so these are examples of a balanced breakfast. Notice how I didn't put bacon on any of those. wonder why. Isn't that something? You know, when I go to heaven, I'm going to eat bacon every day. I'm just not in a hurry to get there. <laughs> okay. Okay, some other exam. Okay, yes, ma'am. It's a good question. I get it every time. And the answer, it's not any better than pork bacon. It's just as high in sodium. And do you know that poultry fat, poultry fat is just as bad at clogging our arteries, some say worse, than pork fat? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? So that turkey bacon, it's just give it to the dog. He'll run it off if he's not too old. Okay. So what can I eat at breakfast as a meat? That's what I get all the time. Well, if I'm not worried about sodium, ham would be a lean choice. But a better choice than that would be a piece of fresh pork uh, from the pork loin. Uh, you know, pork loin, y'all have seen pork loins in the store? Pork loin, we, we have this image that pork is bad for us. It's because of the bacon and sausage. Pork loin is as lean as chicken. Pork loin is a good, healthy meat. We use it on Memorial Cooking Innovations all the time. It's, it's, uh, in fact, the, uh, the show that's coming up in September is a coffee show, and we do a coffee-crusted pork loin steak. It's a delicious recipe that Chef Manny and I developed. All of the recipes that we do on Memorial Cooking Innovations, these aren't from a can somewhere. You won't find them anywhere else. There might be a variation of something you find somewhere else. But he and I developed these recipes. Okay? Uh, but pork loin cut thin is, is a reasonable uh, breakfast meat. Okay? It's lean. Well, that's a matter of, yeah, uh, normally if you were going to do it like a piece of ham, you'd cut it qu quarter inch. It'd be, you know. Let me ask you this. Uh, uh, okay, hold on just a second. Can we coordinate what I should have and shouldn't have uh, for, dark, for heart, diabetes, and kidney failure? Okay, it's a good question. Okay, can I, can I follow the same guidelines if I have both heart, kidney, heart and kidney uh, problems and diabetes. If it wasn't for the kidney, I could say yes. Okay? The kidney problems are a separate issue altogether, and, and for that, you really have, there's a separate set of guidelines. But as far as the heart and diabetes part, this balanced meal that I'm talking about, this is a handout that I developed for people in the Polk Center teaching about controlling blood sugar. Every time that we eat a balanced meal, we're, that, that helps us to control blood sugar. Okay, you had a question. What meat would you substitute if pork is not part of your diet? You don't eat it at all. For, well, are you talking about for breakfast? Any meal. Pork is not allowed in your diet. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, okay, uh, round steak would be a good lean beef. You're looking for meats that are lean. Certainly chicken and fish, no skin. Okay, uh, poultry skin you don't want. But chicken and fish and round steak would be a, a lean example of a beef. And you had a question back here that I didn't get to. Well, <coughs> it's higher in sodium, yes. <coughs> it's better than our bacon because it's leaner. Okay, but it, it's still a sodium issue. That's right. Okay. 
Okay, let's talk about cooking dried beans because that's something that that uh, that we. It's something I'm promoting is beans and peas, but let's make a pot of beans for a minute. Now this is a little bit different than how our mother and grandmother made beans. We're not going to start with pork fat, okay? We don't want to do that. Instead, we're going to start with... Uh, don't let them take the lunch away because we haven't eaten. Uh, Instead, we're going to start with some olive oil, extra virgin olive oil in the, in the stock pot or where, whatever you're going to cook your beans in. Then we're going to, as Chef Manny says, we're going to sweat the onions. We're going to dice onion and garlic and add them. And sweating the onions means that you're just cooking them until they smell good. You're cooking them, a recipe will say, until they're translucent. Okay? All right, y'all know that part. All right, you're releasing the flavor is what you're doing. Okay, then to that pot of beans, all right, now you've already soaked your beans, okay? You soaked them and then poured the soak water off. Y'all remember this, okay? Then to that pot of beans, you're going you're gonna, to, um, to the pot, you're going to throw in your soaked beans. And instead of adding water, you're going to add low-sodium vegetable broth, not chicken broth. If, if it says low-sodium, okay. But the key on whatever kind of broth you use is low sodium. If you use just the regular chicken broth, it's going to be too salty. It'll be way too salty. You have to get the one that says low sodium. You can find this in, it's usually on the soup aisle. It's in a, like a waxed box that's about this big and about that thick. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen these? Okay. The key on that is low sodium. All right. There you're adding... Uh, uh, flavor to the beans. See, we, we took away the pork so we lost some flavor there. You're adding flavor th through the broth. You're adding flavor from the fresh onion and fresh garlic. Don't use garlic powder. I mean, it's, it's okay if you don't have fresh garlic, but it's, it's just tastes better using fresh. Okay? Uh, and you can use the jars. That you can use that one, but I just like the fresh better. You hear us say on MCI, the flavor is in the freshness. So the more fresh we can eat, the more flavor we get. And you know what else? The more nutrients we get. Okay. So back to this pot of beans. We've got the, uh, the broth, the, uh, the vegetable broth there. Then we're going to cook those beans until they're soft. And we're going to add whatever flavors you want to add. Now, here, here again we have an opportunity to add back a flavor that we missed from the pork. And, and what we're going to use there is fresh herb. Uh, the, the herb that I like, now you can pick the ones that you like, but oregano goes very good in beans. You ever cook beans with oregano? Fresh oregano, it's easy to grow. You put it in a pot, just water it every now and then, make sure it's got sun, and it will grow, and you can clip off of it forever. My, cumin goes good in beans, okay. Okay, chili powder, okay, those are good seasonings. And, and then when you're done, when the beans are done, you know, you've tested them there, and the, the flavor is where you want it, add a can of no salt added diced tomatoes. That's right. You add some good color to it. You're, you're bringing in a deep, rich vegetable. Okay, so you've got color, you've got eye appeal, you've got texture. And you talk about a good pot of beans. Now you've got a good pot of beans there and you cooked them without bacon or pork fat. Now see, that wasn't any harder than doing it the traditional way, but you've got a much healthier pot of beans there. Okay, we're getting close on time, so let me just sum up a little bit. Uh, I, uh, I, I knew that I would have more information for you than what I'd have time for. We talked about diet versus healthy eating. You know, healthy eating is making small changes at a time. It's about including nutrient-dense foods. Okay, we talked about maintaining muscle mass and a little bit about how we want a protein food at every meal. And we should be eating three meals a day. We shouldn't skip a meal. When we skip a meal, we come to the next one too hungry, we overeat. Okay, uh, we talked about blood pressure and the three minerals that lower blood pressure, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. Okay, uh, uh, and we talked about controlling blood sugar a little bit, and that was uh, eating a balanced meal. Okay, a uh, couple of things. I was supposed to. We're, we were supposed to do some giveaways today, 
And so, uh, I guess now's as good a time as any, huh? Okay. Um, I, I listed the people who checked in. Um, for those of you who signed up before you came, and I've got numbers 1 through 55. So, Tim, pick a number between 1 through 55. Okay. Jessica, pick a number between 1 and 55.